On this episode of the John 1911 podcast, people who hate Glocks, anti-ship missiles, what's wrong with the NYPD, and that's why people wear kilts. Okay, good evening everybody, this is Kraken and Marky, and this is episode 332 of the John 1911 podcast. Today is Wednesday, I don't know, in February, and it is 8.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and uh, it's February 21st. And uh, we were supposed to have all three of us tonight, but unfortunately, I screwed up. I screwed up the uh, schedule with Danny, and so he will not be joining us. So we could spare everybody uh, uh, political political commentary for this evening. Now you can just switch to Fox News and get that there. You're going to get all guns and baby goats from us every year. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. Kraken sends me a picture and he's like, yeah, I got some, I got some new dogs, got three new little dogs and a uh, picture. And I'm looking at these little dogs, these little puppies. And I'm like, man, those look an awful lot like goats. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I don't know if you're getting old or, you know, it's like, here, grandpa, here's some goats. <laughs> My eyesight's getting bad. Yeah. They work um, kind of funny too, you know. Oh Yeah. So yeah. is this the first time you've ever had goats? Yeah, first time with, with goats. It was uh, kind of one of them fell into it deals. I was actually at a farmer's house picking up some crappie carcasses to use for bait down the road here in a month or two. And the guy had goats running everywhere. Well, he had a couple. He had one goat in particular that come up to me and jumped up on my leg just kind of like a dog would so I picked it up and was scratching it behind the ears like a dog and it fell asleep in my arms and I like god damn it oh, I gotta no. get a goat oh no my wife's been wanting goats forever so I wound up getting two goats oh no little bottle feeders so do you guys have and this is probably a dumb question because I'm sure you do I, I assume you have bobcats out there right yeah yeah, so I know that around here that, you know, we didn't, bobcats were, you know, they were not normal here. Like, I mean, they had been here in the past, like black bears and everything, but, you know, we killed them all. And um, they've been slowly, you know, letting stuff come back and, you know, banning all this hunting and stuff. And I know that it was a real rough couple years for people in, you know, in like southern Indiana and getting into parts of uh, western Western Ohio where, you know, bobcats would eventually start showing up and decimate people's goats and chickens. Like it would do a number. Yeah. Like they, they'd get in. They'd get into stuff that the coyotes would norm, couldn't get into. And it was a whole new program. So is that kind of what you – I assume these things live like in basically a fortress, right? Yeah, pretty much. They're double fenced and we've got the big dogs. So I think that kind of keeps the, the bobcats at bay. We've actually got a big enough population. We have a hunting and trapping season on them. Uh, I've caught a few on game camera in my woods, but nothing close to the house. So I'm not too worried about it yet. Ever seen a, how, ever, how, what's the biggest bobcat you've ever seen? Oh, I don't know. Probably in that. 35 40 pound range he was I, I saw a trail cam of a bobcat taking down this young deer and i was like this thing had to have been over 40 pounds mm -hmm. i was like i had no idea bobcats could get that big oh yeah oh man oh man so Funniest yeah. bobcat story I have. Uh, I was at a buddy's house. He's he's since passed away, uh, but he drank a lot. He was he was one of those guys that was you know pretty much constantly at least half drunk and just just hilarious at any given time. I mean, just a jokester. And he gets a phone call from a buddy, and he says, "I got a problem." And the guy says, "What's that?" Well, I got a bobcat caught in a raccoon trap. And, you know, there's no season on bobcats in Iowa, so I don't know how the heck to get this thing out of the trap. He says, I'll be right over. And he says, you got to drive, but come with me. We're going to have some fun. Well, we get up there, and it's 
big male bobcat caught in a leg hold trap, and it is pissed off. Mm-hmm. And this is the first time I'd ever been around a bobcat that was alive, you know, in person. And it's like, holy crap. Look at look at my buddy. And I said, how are we going to get that thing out of there? And he said, watch this. He says, you distract him. Walk over there. And he gets an empty five-gallon bucket out of the truck. And he sneaks up behind this thing. Puts five-gallon bucket over the top of it. And then sits on the bucket to catch his breath finish his beer he does this with a beer in his hand mm-hmm. and he pulls this bucket up and he and he pulls on the chain the traps connected to enough just to pull the paw out and then he gets the gets the paw out of the out of the trap and he says last one back to the truck's gonna be dinner and he kicked that bucket and we all ran like hell and that that uh bobcat <laughs> must have shot shot out of there about a hundred mile an hour <laughs> like a heat-seeking missile do you want to talk about three three middle aged fat guys running like Carl Lewis? You've never seen the like. <laughs> hey, now the kids today don't know who Carl Lewis was. You have to say Usain Bolt. They don't know who Carl. <laughs> they don't know Jesse Owens. They got nothing. I bet this. So Us, U, U, Usain or Usain Bolt? Yeah. So I, I I look like Dwight Stone jumping in the back of that truck. Google it, kids. <laughs> So we, I have never seen a bobcat with my own eyes at the John 911 range. However, um, I have posted photographs of tr- tracks, and more than one person has said that those. Because I'm like, man, that's a big. Is that, is that a cat? And they're like, people were saying that they thought it was a bobcat. So we probably have they at least come through our property um i even had heard that over in indiana like in like i don't know maybe middle indiana southern indiana they had we had i think we'd even covered it they were debating introducing a a bobcat season because they had so many bobcats and it's like that's not that far away it's like if they're to the point that they need to hunt these things that's probably coming for us I mean, you know, yeah. within probably a decade, we're going to probably have have bobcat bobcat days, you know. I mean, how well, do when you I hunt? was out there, I saw you know a couple of big flocks of turkeys. So the golden rule is, if you have wild turkeys, you have bobcats. Well, we have lots of turkeys. You have bobcats then. Why? Why? Why does one begin? Like I would think, like if the bobcats came through, maybe we would lose all the turkeys. Uh, the turkeys can just outbreed the bobcats basically, but once the turkeys pitch down out of the trees and, and get on the ground, bobcat stands a decent chance of, of being able to catch a wild turkey. So as tur- wild turkeys were reintroduced into areas where they were before and, and managed, uh, the, the bobcats will naturally follow. So that's oh. what happened in Southwest Iowa. we we uh, reintroduced wild turkeys, and the state managed it, you know, from a, from a game management standpoint. And the bobcats just came up out of Missouri naturally, just, you know, as the feed moves. As a, as a favorite prey moves north, the bobcats just followed it north and got established. And, you know, like in southwest Iowa, it's nothing to see bobcats anymore. Uh, they even have a season over there now, so... You got wild turkeys, you got bobcats. Okay, well that pro- that makes sense because I mean we had seen reports of bobcats as far back as fifteen years ago. You know, you'd get yeah. like some farmer, he'd be like, "If y'all boys out there shooting, don't shoot my bobcat," because there's some, he would <laughs> see one and like you know like damn, was a bobcat here? Um, and now it's to the point where you know people are you're putting up their animals, and you know it's just going to be a matter of time, but um. Like the turkeys, like I just, turkeys just, I don't think they, they reintroduced turkeys. I guess they just kind of came back. I mean, yeah, there's, there's some areas around here have a lot of turkey. I used to see turkey every day, you know. Where I grew up in Iowa, they had to, they had to reintroduce them because they had basically been hunted into extinction in, in Southwest Iowa, say. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we got ours from Missouri. We made a deal with the state of Missouri and they trapped some and brought them up and, you know, there were 
there were some pockets of, of wild turkeys even before they did that. So if you, like when I was coming up, say in my early 20s, if you knew of a, of a timber that held turkeys, you didn't tell anybody because there just weren't that many turkeys around. Now you, you go to a farmer's house to try and get permission to deer hunt and he'll tell you, you know, yeah, as long as you kill every turkey you see too. Uh, what are the turkeys? What are the turkeys? So pop. What do the farmers say about the turkeys? Like I tell you, like my grandfather had a farm, and like I mean, we never saw turkeys, and I mean, like you hardly ever saw. I mean, you you would see deer occasionally, but not like you do now. Yeah. What did the turkeys do to the farmers? The problem with the turkeys is, come spring planting season, when everything germinates and it just breaks the ground. The so whether it's corn or soybeans, when it just breaks the ground, it's real sweet and and juicy and supple, and the turkeys will just go right down the line and they'll just they'll eat every every piece they can get, just like an assembly line, and they can actually be harder on on a field than deer will. Hmm. So you've like, got so, I've so, seen flocks as big as two hundred turkeys before. I've never seen that. Okay, so okay, here's a so here's another question. So I, I have I have, so I have one statement and one question. The first okay. statement is, if if turkey do that much damage to a farmer's field, that sounds like potential for uh you know for somebody a young man uh, with a rifle to sit over a field and you know get paid to you know shoot turkeys off that dude's field in the spring and. The other thing is, so you said, like, they had to reintroduce turkeys into this area, but if you knew of a woods that, that had turkey, turkeys don't really migrate around. Do, are they kind of local? I mean, like, like a deer can have, like, a range of, I don't know, like, what, 15 miles or something? Hmm. Uh, what, With how, a... how does a turkey work? With the wild turkey, they'll basically, let's say there's, uh, you know, 40, 50 acre patch of timber mm -hmm. and there's feed sources and water sources, you know, on the edges of the timbers. They're, they're kind of edge animals anyway. Uh, so if there's suitable roosting trees and there's food and water on the edges, there's no reason for them to go anywhere. Uh, so they would stay in that, you know, especially bigger timbers if they, if they had them. They they just stay there. They don't they don't have to go anywhere. They don't migrate. Uh, you know, there's no reason for them to go two miles across open cornfield to get to a different timber. So what the state did is they went to went to counties that didn't didn't have a lot of turkeys, and they would release, you know, a dozen here, a dozen there, and uh, bump the program up that way over the years. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is I see turkey fairly regularly on the John 1911 range, but never up front. It's when I go back. If I so they, I'll see them, I'll see them behind the 560, the, 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 the last row of targets that we mm -hmm. shot. You know, you can keep going back behind them and there's a dip and it comes up. And that's like, I call that my theoretical 700 yard impact zone. I'll see them there all the time. And then if you go back to the theoretical eight and then back up to the nine, I'll see them back at the nine all the time. And they'll be in the trees. And when you come back there, they'll, they'll go flying off. And then also back there, I see where they do the, the dirt bath thing on the ground where they get this patch. They do they do one back in the primitives in that back corner, and then they actually there's a dirt there's a, another one they do, so right there at the 500 600 yard steel target, right off to the right. If you're looking down range, it's on one of the where the where two trails to service that impact zone. They do that dirt bath thing there too. So you're telling me those turkeys live there? Yeah, they. They they have no reason to leave to leave that area because if I remember correctly, you've got agricultural fields that border your property, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. So they've got the food source, water source, uh, tall enough trees that they can pitch up at night and roost at night, and 
open air the you've got some open area and they like that during breeding season because the toms will get out there and strut and yeah it's i mean it's perfect habitat it's it's turkey hunters heaven out there and it's not a lot of pressure back there because the only time anyone Mm -hmm. goes back there is if i'm back there you know maintaining trails or someone's got to get to a target so it's pretty and we don't you know i mean like people just don't come traipsing through there to get shot so, you know, it's like, hmm, that's interesting. I just assumed that they were kind of transient. I didn't know if they were, you know, if they kind of live there or not. So that's yep, good to there's know. probably generations that live there in that timber and probably never left. And if they're, as long as they're not pushed out, no reason for them to leave. Oh, okay. That's now nice. as far as standing over fields and picking them off. The guys that wear the funny green pants with the woo-woo lights on their trucks, they don't take to that, and they they write big tickets for that. Uh, (laughs) At least around here, anyway, they're considered big game animals, actually. You'll get get in as much legal trouble for poaching a turkey as you will a 150-class buck. There is... So the DNR around the range, like in that county, in the next county over... They, during deer season, they do run checkpoints. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have never seen that. Um, And I have heard multiple stories where you come up to the checkpoint and they'll either, they'll say, shot any turkeys? And maybe someone will say yes, and then they they get them, or they'll be like, "Hey, I need you to open up your whatever," and they don't even look at the deer; they're looking for turkey. Yep, that's interesting. I didn't I didn't know that was that big of a. I mean, yeah, they well, they take a really dim view on that. <laughs> don't, they'll don't want you eating the dark meat. Okay, that's fine. I get it. I understand. No no trip to fan for Marky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. You know what? I wanted to talk to you about this, and we had we had really had a chance to do the. We didn't talk about the Navy stuff. The the Navy stuff going on off the coast of Yemen, did we? We had a chance to talk about that, right? Uh, just vaguely a couple of pods ago when it just oh did just we started getting cranked up a little. Well, bit. then, yeah. like, did we talk about the the the? So there was the one ship that was shooting down everything left and right. And then um, another ship, the Gravely, actually had to engage its Sea Whiz, its CIWS system. Mm-hmm. Did we talk about that on pod? Have you? Yep, we hit that a little bit. The, oh, the did Vulcan we? Phalanx system. Yep, R two D two with a hard on. Yeah. Okay. I was just like, <laughs> I'm still just enthralled by that. Um, I don't know if like uh, well, I heard. I heard that the um, the ship that shot. I can't remember which one. The La- was it the Laughley? Um, that was shooting down everything. I guess the the sink commander. I don't know, like so some admiral that's over them. I don't know. I don't think it was a sink commander, but um, f- flew in a bunch of barbecue to the ship. I like, showed up and they had a big party with barbecue, and it's like <laughs> I don't think that made the news news, but you know, I thought that was I thought that was interesting. And so then it's like those dudes got barbecue, and I can't help but wonder. Like the USS Gravely that had to turn on the Sea Whiz, it's like how close did that missile get to your ship before they saw it? And it's like, hmm, I don't know if them boys got barbecue. Maybe they did. I don't know. But it's like, oh boy, I don't, it's like that. That one's the that'll be the yeah. one where they're still talking about it privately. Well, the be- thing with the Sea Whiz shoot down, the way I understand it, the missile they shot down was a sea skimmer, similar to our harpoons. Yeah, and they can they can be difficult to engage because they they see skim and then they pop up. So, like a Block Two SM two missile has mm-hmm. a ta- has a hard time engaging something that's sea skimming. So then, by the time they do the pop up nu- maneuver and then tip over, uh, sometimes there's just not enough time for for an for an SM two to engage, and that's where your Sea Whiz system kicks in. Well, doesn't the uh, um, isn't the typhoon the ty- our, our typhoon anti ship missile does that? It's not a hyper. It's not a supersonic missile. It's subsonic and it skims, so yep. it's hidden. And then it then it'll it'll. I don't know if it pops up or not. Um, yeah, har- har- harpoons do a do a pop up and then tip over and 
that's part of the reason they're so hard to, they're so hard to, to engage uh, because they pop up pretty close. But when they do the tip over maneuver, they are smoking right in. I mean, they're coming hard. Oh, I didn't know the harpoons had like a had like a a terminal the hot shit phase. Oh yeah, yeah. They when they when once they tip over, they're locked on to target and they are coming hard. Well, you know the um the uh the Russians, they backed out of the uh hold on. I didn't know there was going to be a quiz I would have studied. Is it the MTCR? No, no, that's no, that's a missile technology control regime which is the there's a there's a there's a there's a convention that says you that you can't have anti-ship missiles that'll travel i think more than maybe it was like a hundred miles or something well since the russians have they they were cheating the regime and so they they got out of it and it's like well okay just be careful what you wish for assholes because we've got all this stuff that we're making there's like an as a the l there's a there's a l s l r at is it long range l r s m there's an l r s m long range strike missile and this thing looks like i don't know i mean this thing looks like a I don't even know how to describe it. Like it, it's not, the front of it isn't shaped like a missile. The front of it's shaped kind of like, I don't know, the, it's got this angular, this angled forehead, this angled nose. It looks like a car from like the, from the, from the fifties. And, uh, I can't remember what the range on that one was, but now we have, they're making one called the LR, is it the LRSM, uh, ER extended range. And I, I mean, this thing's supposed to be 300 or maybe, maybe more miles and it's this hot shit, high tech missile. And, um, and one of the plans that we had, like, if we're going to, if we're going to be fighting the, uh, the, uh, Chinese Navy in the Pacific is a lot of people don't realize this is one of the, you know, one of the, the, the things that actually would come in very handy is the, um, the, uh, the, the P8. Um, the P3 Orion, the P8, is it the Poseidon, the anti-sub, the big, the big anti-sub jet, right? It's like a 737. Is that right? Is yep. that, so they're, they're been equipping, they've been equipping those with these anti-ship missiles. And it's like these, these things, I mean, I mean, they can fly across half the ocean. Like it's not like a, you know, uh, you know, uh, like a little fighter jet that can only go so far attack fire. These things can, I mean, like they go for great distances and it's, it's almost like having a whole new capability to patrol parts of the ocean that can attack surface ships, like with very sophisticated weapons. And just this week, the U S government announced that they have a anti ship missile. They're not saying what it is. I don't. I, I don't know if it's. I think it's. I think it's something else. But it. It. It'll fit. Four of them will fit within the bomb bays of the F thirty five. So so it, the F thirty five can carry these and be stealthy. The F thirty five. I think the F thirty five. A can carry four of them. The F thirty five A and the F thirty five. C can each carry four of these anti-ship missiles and still maintain a stealthy profile to attack, you know, surface ships. And I think they're thinking they may be able to get two of them onto uh, the the F thirty five B, the the Marine Corps one that you know goes up and down. Mm-hmm. But it's like all of a sudden it's like all these anti-ship missiles, and I'm I'm going some reason, reason I'm talking about all this is I am super interested. In anti-ship missile technology, anti because that's really where submarines and anti-ship missiles is going to be where where the you know the fight is won or lost in the Pacific, and you're really seeing that with even the stuff going on and you know with the war in Ukraine and some of these attacks on these Russian ships, it's like you know it's going to be super interesting. You know, it's like the idea that. 
you know, like you could like there's there's all these different ways now to kill ships that weren't really viable unless you got really close, just like 15 years ago. And we're starting, it's like, we're starting to really see it. Like, I mean, even in, you know, again, it's not the same, it's not the same technology or the same, same weapon, but I mean, you're seeing all these little cheap Chinese drones that the, that the Ukrainians are flying around. Like they're literally chasing tanks and blowing up tanks. You see, you literally even like little, DJI drones with explosives. You see, or like a, like a, a Russian soldier, he's running, and there's a DJI drone chasing his ass and blows up on him. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, I mean, it's just, I mean, like the, the it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. You know, it's going to be interesting to see like the technology the technology curve has has bent so much that you you kind of hope that maybe a bunch of people don't get caught off guard because they assume the next war is going to go like the last war that they're not seeing what's obvious in front of their face you know like billy mitchell was like fuck your battleships bitches like we're going to kill you with fucking airplanes and everyone was like fuck you you're crazy and it's like uh huh like i mean they're pearl harbor and the brits did it to the italians and and it, you know at that as a turret is it Torino or Toronto? Toronto, Toronto. It's like I don't know. Like this web, these these this missile stuff is becoming super interesting because you don't think of and going back to the gravely. Like I don't think of a bunch of dirt billy Houthis being able to have a sea skimming missile. You know what I'm saying? No, they don't. They don't. But the Iranians do, and there's you know the Iranian pipeline. Sea skimmer technology has been around since the early 80s that I know of for sure so you know the the technology it's I don't want to say open source but it's not very close hold source anymore Mm -hmm. Uh, the the weapons you're talking about they're developed specifically to kill carriers Uh, in the 80s when I was in the carriers were it's the carriers were the queen on the chessboard and we layered our defenses to protect carriers and the technology at the time made carriers pretty defendable now as technology goes there are a lot of people sounding warning alarms that are saying big fat slow carriers can be easy targets because of the like you said the technology curve so what we're seeing off the coast of yemen is I think the next generation of naval warfare kicking off and this is becoming a learning curve on how to deal with moderately low tech capabilities that can kill a ship. So uh, I personally think that's one reason why we haven't went in there and, and just pounded the Houthis into the dirt we're kind of seeing what what some of these lower tech lower budget capabilities are and what we need to do to defend against them we're confident that we can defend against them but every time that that we have a shoot x we're we're gaining information and gaining knowledge shoot x it's kind of a dick thing to say (laughs) (laughs) that went over most people but i caught that um Fun so, fact, yeah. <laughs> but, but ju- just I'm gonna just to illuminate something you said. So Kraken's talking about you know, um, and it's still true, but like you know, if we were going to get in a fight with the Soviets and the Soviet Navy or the Soviet Air Force, you know, we have these big aircraft carrier battle groups, and then we have the aircraft that fly combat air patrols, and you know, people that are familiar with the movie Top Gun and the F-14, and then the Phoenix missile, and the Phoenix missile has a range of a hundred miles. Well, the F-14 was not designed to be this turn-and-burn dogfighter like a F-16. The F-14 is a big airplane that, you know, it's got its wings that open wide for slow and slow down low, but it's supposed to be a super high – it was designed to be a super high-altitude fighter interceptor, that they and they would go out and they'd fire all of these Phoenix missiles at – 
you know, incoming Russian bombers, like, you know, 40 Russian bombers are coming at the uh, the aircraft carrier battle group and they would, you know, be killing them at like 100 miles. And then the Russians, would, the, the surviving bombers would fire their kitchen missiles and they'd be going at the carrier groups. And it was it was this whole, you know, and, you know, while missile technology existed and even like the idea of, you know, the you know, like the the Chinese want to target carriers now with their with their I can't remember what the I can't remember what their 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 carrier killers called. And you know, you have a kill chain you gotta be able to target and how long it takes a missile to, you know, parabolically fly and, you know, the satellite can, you know, can it find the carrier and the carrier can move in thirty minutes or whatever, can you actually hit it? Um you know, but now you've got like dudes like Houthis with sea skimming missiles and you've got you know have you seen have you seen the um the unmanned um i don't know what they call them i guess they call them unmanned what do they call these things unmanned surface you can is it is it unmanned basically like they're little remote controlled boats these little suicide boats mm-hmm. have you seen these things and I, have, I haven't seen them. I've heard about them. The videos are unbelievable. Like, every, but every, but every month or so, like they started. I remember there was videos of uh, some of these things were, were seen coming. They look a little speed. They're like little itty bitty speedboats, and you know they're packed with communications gear and targeting pod and explosives. And I remember this thing was like, these things were coming in. They had gone in. They had gone deep into um, Sevastopol, the the naval base in Crimea, and were hitting stuff. And like, there's you know, like one of the Russian ships woke up to it. And they're they're shooting at this at this little speedboat as it's trying to, and the speedboat's turning because they're controlling it with you know like a drone, like you know, controlling it with a with a controller from like 300 miles away, and they hit it and it explodes. But there's videos now. There was another Russian ship. Well, you know the Moskva that was sunk by the, basically they call it the Harpunsky, which was the Ukrainian kind of knockoff of the Harpoon missile. You know, if you you know, was it last year? They sunk a they sunk a was it an LST or was it another one of those Moskva class frigates? But they sunk this just like two weeks ago or ten days ago with these drone boats and you see the drone boats swarming around and literally one of them, like you're getting a first person view cause it's recording video. There's a, there's a drone boat. You're looking at it through night vision as it's coming in and swerving and coming into this Russian ship. And as it gets closer to the ship, you can literally see a hole in the water line and you can see inside the ship where the previous drone boat whacked into it and put a big ass hole in it. Then it, boom, it hits it. It's just like, this is unreal. It's like a remote controlled torpedo. Yes. And it's just like, you know, like even American ships, you know, like the, um, what was the ship? What was the U.S. ship that was? As a matter of fact, it was in Yemen. It was in it was in in port in Yemen, and it got it got hit by a suicide boat. Uh, that was the coal, wasn't it? Is that the coal? Yeah, that is the coal, and it almost sank the boat. And yeah. they you know, had to bring it, They actually brought it back on a barge. Yeah, they had to. I the think it was a Nor- Norwegian or something. They had yeah. some big company up from up north in the Baltics to do it, but um. You know, I, I don't know if there's enough defenses on on U.S. naval ships. Like if if five of these swarming remote control boats come come barreling at a U.S. destroyer, I mean, can a, can a destroyer fight that off? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, can a destroy? I mean. I mean, like, okay, if these are or these are small enough, like a U.S. destroyer could probably detect i would like to think could detect them over the horizon with radar maybe right uh maybe? that'd be tough because they're pretty small and if they've got any any stealth technology built into them i mean they're mm-hmm. if they're fiberglass and 
you know, they're not going to put off much of a, a reflective signature. And depending mm-hmm. upon the guidance package, you might not get much of an electronic signature, you know, from intercepts. So I'm guessing when they get close enough that Aegis could probably slave a sea whiz to it. But you're probably looking at, you know, just man in the rail with, you know, uh, Ma Deuces and, and, you know, 240s and, you know, whatever they have for, you know, light light automatic weapons. I don't know if, you know, the, the Navy still has pigs on the boat or not, but, you know, that's, that's probably going to be your best defense until they can figure out a way to detect these and and be able to slave a weapon system to them. Well, the ones they're using in Ukraine, I've heard um, through various sources, not that it's like super secret, but basically it's developed in conjunction with maybe DARPA. Like DARPA's, you know, basically kind of giving some of the technology to Ukraine and Ukraine, you know, maybe some advisors Mm -hmm. are using and some, and and you know what, when you look at some of these, they do, they do have stealth characteristics, you know, they're, they're angular looking, you know, Mm -hmm. you're like, oh shit. And it's like, I don't know, like a a U.S. Navy frigate sailing at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, there's nobody manning the 50 anywhere. Well, they're, they're manning it, but being able to see this thing in time to engage it, you know, you probably, there's probably a very short window from the time you could physically see it and and engage it. So uh, I'm sure they've upped the armed watches and there's, you know, probably a a full gun team on every team, on every gun, but. Well, I know the Navy's been, they're starting to deploy these now. They've actually got one or two they've got deployed in the, um, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, in or in that in that in that combatant command, we've got laser some kind of laser now that we're putting on our boats that they literally because as fast as you can look at it, you can just you're burned. Smoke. Then like you look at the next one, you look at the next one, you look at the next one, and it's theoretically you know unlimited you know it's you know, unlimited ammo. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that's that might be one of their answers for. I know that's going to be an answer for a lot of these drones. Like there, you'll see they've done. You'll see some testing they've done where um, you can't even see the laser during the day. So they switch to a uh, an infrared camera during the day, and you can clear. And so it, it looks all crazy looking, but then you can literally clear as a bell. See this laser beam coming out from the ship, and it's burning up this boat. And it's one of those things where I think we're going to get to a point where, you know, with some of this drone technology, you know, like you'll like the the, the Iranians will have a they'll release a video and they'll be like, ah, oh, here's a, you know, we're here we're, we're we have a video looking down at the at the at the USS Ford, you know, sailing in the, you know the Persian Gulf and like they don't know we're here and it's like then the Navy will release a a photograph of a of a Seahawk helicopter behind the drone, filming the drone with the carrier being like, yeah, we knew you were there. (laughs) And, you know, like they play all these games, but there's probably going to come a point when this stuff's going to become so dangerous and so unpredictable. It's going to become standard fare. If there's anything that's like drone-like near you, just hit it with a laser and kill it. And it's like, if you kill somebody's DJI camera, well, too fucking bad. And, and, you know, it makes you wonder, it's like, you know, don't fire unless fired upon. Eh, does, but maybe the laser, we can go ahead and fire first. Do you know what I mean? Because no one can really see it. I just, you know, you just kind of wonder what the rules of engagements are going to end up being. And I suspect right now they're pretty liberal and I would be, I wouldn't be hesitant to say there's probably some weapons platforms that are being used right now that we're not finding out about similar to to stuff that you just described. Uh, I really don't see anybody shitting their britches over, over the Houthis. Uh, I see this more as a training opportunity and a, uh, a T and E opportunity for, for some different platforms that are in development. Uh, yeah, the, I'll tell you what they're, they're, when were they supposed to retire the B one bombers? 
Oh the God, bu- long time they, ago. And they and they're still keeping them because the, you know the, the you know they they've extended the life the B fifty two, and you know they finally got the they got the 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 B the B two they've extended that and then. You know, because the B twenty one Raider, I guess, was delayed or something. But their, mm. you know, their goal is the B twenty one Raider supposed supposed to replace all the B ones and the B twos when they that this the new Raider. And I just, you know, when when they were talking about when they went after the Houthis, and it was like, well, who's going to go after them? And like they flew all these B one bombers, and part of me just was like, you know, they're just like. Nah, go ahead and get you some before you before we <laughs> hang this one up. Because the V one, you know, they you know they've done some close air support stuff in like you know you know in Afghanistan and you know maybe some stuff in Iraq, but you know it's not a great loitering airplane. You know what I mean? Like you know, but it's just like okay, so yeah, they're gonna you know like. They they just they decided you know no B fifty twos no B twos they were like all the B ones let's I can't remember where the B ones are at but I just I just know that there's like Dakotas. a bunch of guys yeah they're just like fuck yeah bitches <laughs> give them the bone baby so, <laughs> so I have this this mental image of a squadron of Lancers sitting in 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 the Dakotas right now with like. Little Houthi rebels with a spear painted on the side for the number of kills they have. Dude, did you just call the Houthi rebel spear chuckers? You did not do that. I, I did not. I think I think it'd be a camel. I'm just saying. I think it's going to be a camel. I don't think it's going to be. I think you got the wrong. You got the wrong. You got the wrong icon. Off the map key. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, again, tip of the hat to the Navy. I'm, I think a lot about this kind of stuff. I remember as a kid in 1982 when the Brits went down to the Falkland Islands to fight the Argentinians, and the Argentinians were zipping all over the place with their A4s, and I just remember the. The Argentinians had bought these French Exocet missiles, and this missile hit the uh, uh, Type 80, the HMS Sheffield, Type 82. Was it a Sheffield a destroyer? Was a Sheffield a dest- destroyer or frigate? I can't remember. I think it was a frigate. Frigate and service. and I, I, I didn't it did it broke did it break it it broke in half didn't it yeah. Oh yeah, it it totally destroyed it. And it's just like this idea of like I mean, again, it's nice to do. I mean, like people like today that don't understand. Like in 1982, Ronald Reagan was president, and we were all pre, you know you know the chances of going to war with the with the Soviet Union was real high, and you know there was a missile out there that could break a ship in half, and it was like holy shit balls. Um, and um, well, wasn't it the um. The Stark, yeah, in the the Stark in the um in the Persian Gulf years later, didn't the Stark eat two exosets and it actually stayed afloat, right? Yep, one of uh, them would have been eighty seven. Yeah, that seems about right. Then because I was the... I was deployed in the Med when that happened. Uh, we actually flew Tiger teams to help keep her afloat. Yeah. And uh, they they did that because they had the Iraqis had taken Exocet missiles and strapped them to civilian looking uh, uh, like Learjet type aircraft. Is it? It's right, like some kind of Saab mm-hmm. or Learjet. Like so, like it was you know it's moving in the airspace, and they were thinking it was you know, some kind of whatever. It wasn't a military aircraft and it was carrying exosets. And, you know, it's just like this missile technology ever since then, really, you know, with, with naval warfare in particular has really, you know, really got my attention. You know, I also remember as a kid, like the, there was an anti-tank missile that was top attack and it would like melt the tank. And I remember being like, Ooh, fuck, I don't want to go in armor. Um, <laughs> I'd rather be shot than be <laughs> melted. <laughs> it was like, fuck that. I'd rather be shot. So anyway, I'm just kind of rambling here. So 
So did you have to ban anybody um, for the Glock commentary? Uh, just one spam porn bot. That's all? Okay. No, no, nobody that got totally obnoxious. So I, I thought, I thought there was, you know, I thought it was a needed thing. You know, I, for the listener, I basically, I wrote an article that says, you know, people that have like a, an, an unhealthy, like hatred to Glocks typically can't shoot. <laughs> it's like, you know, I was like, you know, goes, Rawr! like I just, you know, people are like, Ooh, it's like, you know, do you spin it some hackles, but just not in the way I thought it would. Yeah. I didn't uh, know if that was going to spin out of control. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, the people that seemed to get their hackles raised, couldn't differentiate between the point you were trying to make on people hacking on any brand of gun without the, without the, the CV to back it up. And they would get wrapped around the axle on, well, we don't hate the Glocks. We hate the fanboys. Well, we're not talking about the fanboys. We're talking about the people passing negative judgment on guns who, you know, can't can't hit a hit the A zone at seven yards, slow fire. But even but the whole fanboy thing is still just compensating for not being able to shoot. Because mm-hmm. it's easy to buy a gun. You know what I mean? And then you're in the club, you know? And it's like, I, you know, like, you, you see those dudes, like, here's my every, you know, you see the these dudes that post these photographs. Here's my everyday carry. I carry every day or whatever. You look at this gun, you're like, my God, this thing looks like it's unused. Like, there's not a scratch on it. It's like, every day? Really, huh? You telling me? Every day? Where do you work? At the cotton factory? It's like, you know, <laughs> what? like, what is this? I don't, you know, and it's like, oh, because you bought a gun. So you can get on a gun forum and, you know, whatever, you know, because the set, because, you know, the reality is, you know, these kids, you know, they can, you know, like the H, like the, you know, one guy, and I'm not singling out this guy to criticize him. I'm just using him as a, as an example to prove a point. And he goes, and again, he, if he listens to the podcast, I'm not, I'm not dumping on you. But you made a point and you said, what's the difference between a Glock and a high point? And you said a couple hundred dollars. And, you know, well, that's an interesting comment maybe on a gun forum, you know. And the reality is a dude that knows how to shoot can show up with a high point and probably run rings around the guy that just bought, uh, you know, bought the uh, bought the HK or bought the, you know, bought the Glock. You know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, come on, guys. Well, well, here's a prime example of that. Back in the 80s, when I first hit the streets, the we were just transitioning into, into semi-automatics really hard. So half the guys on a force might be shooting revolvers still. And the younger guys were coming in and rotating into the semi-autos because they were new and fresh and took off to the academy with them. So a lot of these guys were showing up with, you know, whatever version of the Wonder Nine their department issued them, thinking they were, you know, uh, king shit with this with this new super duper fifteen shot nine millimeter. When in fact, the old sergeant with twenty two years on the job still shooting the old Model Ten with grooved receiver sights on it could shoot circles around them with what most would consider an inferior weapon, but he's been shooting it for 20 years and has a gazillion rounds through it and knows it, you know, beware of the old man with a gun because he probably knows how to use it. Yeah. You know, it, 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 I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's fun and it's easy to buy stuff. It's takes effort to actually, you know, use stuff and get better with it. So, Hey, I got a question. I was in a gun store. I've been snooping around some different gun stores, places I've never been before. And I was in one yesterday that this guy, he was fine. He was fine. He was fine. (laughs) But he, and he had some interesting stuff in there. But he, um, you know, I didn't, you know, I'm just a guy. I kind of, you know, like I didn't like tip my hand at all. Like I'm just, 
like to be anonymous and just go in and see what there is to see. And he had there were some interesting guns in there that I was surprised to see. And then he starts talking, and one thing he told me was that Anderson Manufacturing makes Colt AR-15 lowers. And I was okay. like, I'm just like, oh, really? Like, I'm just, I'm just like, I didn't want to be like, I mean, I don't, I don't think they do. Um, Anderson's actually here and basically in Cincinnati. They're in Erlanger, Kentucky. They're in Erlanger, I guess. Yeah. Or Heber. No, Heber, Kentucky. They're right across, they're right across the river. And, um, I don't know, like. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard that? Is is Anderson Manufacturing make that? Then I looked last night on the internet. And one guy was like, "I guess Anderson Manufacturing." This guy claimed on the internet that Anderson Manufacturing used to make um, Johnny Noveski's lowers, Noveski guns. And I was like, I don't know "You know, I either. I've heard stuff like that, and." I kind of fall right in the middle because part of me says I don't find that hard to believe because we've kind of had this discussion, you know, that a lot of these manufacturers are outsourcing the the majority of their parts anyway. But on the flip side, I've also heard that, you know, from the guys that, you know, my $49 Anderson lower is just as good as your $300 Nobesky lower. Hmm. Uh so I could see it. I, you know, I have no, no strong feelings either way. I could, I could argue it from either side as believable, but I have no solid information. So who knows? I just, you know, I, I don't, you know, like I shoot guns. I don't. And again, I'm not even saying that, you know, attack rifle is not my strongest. So I'm, a, I'm primarily a pistol shooter and then maybe a precision rifle shooter. Attack rifle is not my bag. But, you know, I was just like, I don't know. Like, it just, you know, I just, it just seemed, that seemed to be a bit much to me. It, it so. seems to me kind of like gun shop FUD lore. But I've been around long enough to to learn that occasionally the gun shop FUD lore turns out to be true. Uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, I, I'm sure the AR guys will know. I'm sure we'll get a fair amount of feedback because there's all these. Because, again, this kind of circles back to the point, and I'm going to be kind of a dick. Um, I don't mean to be, but, um, you know, you'll get a lot of these AR guys that they'll know every single lot number or vendor or, I don't know, they'll know every place, every little nuanced piece of data about a Colt rifle, but they can't really shoot, but they're gun guys. And it's like, okay, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, but, they're, but they're the guys that like, oh, yeah, you know how to shoot. It's like, okay, I guess. Like, you know, you you know a lot of shit you read on the internet, but I don't, I don't you know, you can't really shoot that yeah. well. It's like, okay. Because, that, because again, that's easy. They've got so, the jersey. Uh, yeah, they got the jersey. That's right. That's what the phrase, that's the phrase I even read in an article. <laughs> that's the phrase, the jersey, the jersey boys, the jersey wears. They buy a jersey so they can be cool and, and do whatever. So, so um, how was the Valentine's Day with the missus? Did you have a good Valentine's Day? Uh, when's Valentine's Day? Okay, well, this might be an oh, article. Yeah. That's when I got the goats. <laughs> okay, she got, you got she got goats for Valentine's Day. You, oh man! Oh no, no shit! That's the day I got them. I'm dead serious. That is that's actually. I waited. Awful. I waited till the fifteenth to get her chocolate because it was half price. That is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Man. The bad part is is she really liked the goats, so it was probably the best Valentine's gift I've ever gotten her. There's a story on the internet, and let's see here. Um woman trashes boyfriend's apartment after no Valentine's Day gift. Woman posted this on Reddit. Chaotic 26 second video posted to the public freakout subreddit showed a woman walking through an apartment which was totally trashed let me can you um let me see here with this 
I'm going to send you this. Let me see if this will. Let's see if this will send as a as a direct thing, or if it'll send it as a as a saved article. So anyway, so you, just so you can see the pictures. So twenty six videos. She makes her way through the space. Oh. She's, <laughs> also the pictures came through. So this woman. She took a, a cell phone camera and she's walking through her boyfriend's apartment. Let me read this first. It'll describe the pictures. As she makes her way through the space, she slams the occupant of the apartment, who is believed to be her boyfriend, showing off the destruction she caused. Let's see here. So, uh, fuck you, she says at the start of the clip, which is, uh, the gr- uh, ladies, if you don't get you nothing for Valentine's Day, you need to call 1-800-THAT-GIRL. I specialize in home wrecking, whether it's your baby daddy, boyfriend, or her man. We get the job done, money back guaranteed. Let's see here. Um, as the woman walks through the apartment, viewers are given a glimpse into the complete destruction of the apartment where the woman appears to have ruined many large pieces of furniture. So it looks like she she went to the master bedroom and I guess the the headboard and footboard of this bed are like have are upholstered. It looks like she took knives and cut all this furniture up. She's cut the she's cut all the pillows and spread them all around the bedroom. It was, she's pulled stuff out of the cabinets in the kitchen, smashed stuff on the floor, dumped things out of the refrigerator. Um, let's see here. Uh, then it's, then she pans around the kitchen with food open and smeared on the floors and appliances and the freezer door left wide open. There are also multiple containers left on the bench and the cabin door is also open. Uh, then, oh, 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 here's pictures of, uh, is this the living room? Is that, did she cut up, cut up sofas? Yeah, it looks, looks like, like it. Looks like she took ketchup and went around the, the sofa with like ketchup on the floor and on the carpet. Oh, there's, oh my gosh, she went to the bathroom too. Oh. Uh, there's a product smeared all she over went the mirror. Full Freddy Krueger on the bed. Oh my God, yeah. A bathroom sink and counter and one of the cabinet doors has been, she ripped the cabinet door off. It, the, she lit her, oh my God. <laughs> I wonder if she's a redhead. <laughs> It's so, very possible. I'm married to one. <laughs> I knew that. Um, <laughs> so, they say, you know, better get your bitch some goats. <laughs> so you're going <laughs> to. At least, at least those half price Reese's peanut butter cups shaped like hearts. So, so when, so when your wife reached out to pick up one of the goats out of your arms, did you flinch a little bit? Like, no, like, okay. <laughs> like, okay. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it started out when we first moved out here because she grew up on a farm. So she's like, we could get goats, and chickens and horses. And I'm like, and that's where the rifle range can go. And that's where the pistol range is going to go. And so we wound up with, we just stayed with dogs. So about the 12th or so is when I said, I, I think I'm going to get a couple goats. No, you're not. <laughs> So we had two days of nah, 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 nah. well, I just went and got them anyway. And when I walked in the front door with them, I put them on the floor. And of course, we got hardwood floors, so they just they went nowhere really fast, but a fair mile an hour. Uh, and she just melted, and yeah, she's she's all in love. Bottle feeds them. We had to get goat this, goat that. We had to make a goat pin the other day. Wait, 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 wait. What's goat this and goat that? They have like goat stuff oh, at the pet store have, now? Oh, tra- there's a whole aisle of nothing but goat shit at Tractor Supply Store. So we've got a we've got goat leashes, goat haulers, halters, goat bottles with special little goat nipples. We got the powdered goat mix that smells exactly like the vanilla protein powder for a third of the price. Uh, we got a, I got a great big old tote that I cut a hole in and threw hay in it. And so we got the goat house with the goat enclosure. So it's got, you know, yard time. So, okay. All right. <laughs> I want to ask a very tough question. Like I assumed that out around the John 1911 range, that people with goats 
the only the only tragedy of the bobcat eating the goat was because the bobcat ate the goat before the human ate the goat. Do people not eat goats? Goats are actually very tasty. Uh, the but guy that I got these goats from, it's actually what he raises them for. We have a decent Arab population in Lincoln. Uh, really? So in the spring, yeah, in the spring, they want goats around 85 pounds or so for like the Ramadan feast. And uh, there's there's a there's an old joke in this part of the neck of the woods. You know, when you see an old beat to shit Chevy S10 hoopty with two Mexicans in the cab and a goat tied up walking around in the bed of the pickup. They're going to a barbecue. The goat just doesn't know he's the guest of honor yet. <laughs> so what do the do the Ramadan guys, do they do the whole like they take the knife and cut the goat's throat right there like as part of the ceremony? Is that how that works? Like as PETA hasn't figured that one out yet, right? Yeah, they haven't figured that one out. Uh there it's basically not a lot different from a hog roast. Usually they uh you know, they'll stuff the chest cavity with rice and and stuffings and stuff like that, and then it's slow roasted over an open fire. Uh, if you've been to if you've been to Mediterranean, and it's actually it's really good. Uh, if you've ever been to the Mediterranean and eaten street meat falafels, really good chance it's it was goat meat. Although usually, you know, if you're a sailor, you were too drunk to care. So mm -hmm. most sailors anyway have ate goat and probably never even realized it, but. Yeah, you slow roast it like a like a hog at a Sunday afternoon barbecue. Is there very, a lot very of meat, tasty? Is, the, is there a lot of meat on a goat compared to other livestock animals? Yeah, on a goat, it's about fifty percent edible meat. Really? Yeah. Uh, so you know the return on investment for the hang weight is actually pretty good. My mom should have gotten goats instead of cats. We would have eaten better. There is a huge market for goats. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But well, I'm just again, like, you well, know, who would, who would have supplied the Chinese buffets with all their meat? Yeah. Well, like you always hear those stories, you know, when like the, the Chinese immigrants or the Vietnamese immigrants come to town, like all the stray cats are disappearing and people get upset. <laughs> Yep, but then nobody the will really nobody will really deny it. It's like <laughs> he'd have that, that one out either. That one meme, you know, for the for the Chinese buffet sign out front. We know see your cat. Try our chicken. It perfect. Yeah. You know what? For anyone that's gonna send us hate mail, <laughs> this is the same podcast where we have talked about the restaurant in Adams County, Ohio. That has gotten busted, I think now twice for serving horse meat because those hillbillies they think they can get away with it, and the only reason they don't they don't shut that restaurant down is because it's the only restaurant in the county where people can eat. So, yeah, so old Mikey's so has been busted for selling horse meat. So you know we can make fun of, of the hillbillies for the horse meat. We can make fun of the of the of the Chinese the Vietnamese restaurants for the cat meat. So hey, I mean look. Hasn't anyone We're ever seen Hill Street Blues? We make fun of everybody. You, you remember Hill Street Blues? You remember Hill Street Blues, the TV show? Hey, now, be careful out there. Yeah, what well, do you remember? Okay, so you remember the guy that was the undercover cop? He was always dirty. What was his name? Danko. Tech, what was, was it? Danko. I might have was been Danko. Dank. The, was Danko the, the undercover cop, or was he kind of the rednecky guy? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the undercover. We're going cop. back a lot of years. Ago. 1982, probably about the year yeah. that the you know the Sheffield cracked in half. So there's a yeah. scene. So it's like this this undercover cop. He's dressed like a bum, and he's on. He's you know in this alley, and he's sitting and talking to this guy, and he's eating this. And like there's a little open fire, and he, you know the undercover cop. He's eating the food, and you know there's cat his pet cats around. Around he's like you know it's warm. It's a cold winter you know day, and the guys eating the food are talking is like, man, you're really nice. You know, like, and this is really nice. I really appreciate you. And like, he, like this undercover cop, like he, this one moment, he's not, <laughs> not being, you know, just drained by the dirtiness and the jackassery of the streets. And he's like, this is, and then I really appreciate you sharing your food with me. I, this is really good. What is this? 
And the guy looks at him with the cats and holds up a, li- a little collar with a bell on it and goes, Rear! And, and shakes it, <laughs> ding, 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 ding. And the cop, he starts going, blah, blah. So that's what I, that's what I, you know, look, we were making these jokes 40, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, 42 years ago. So get over yourselves. So anyway, I got another story. Do you like UFC? Uh, not as much as I used to, but, uh, yeah, I still watch it occasionally. Yeah. It's not as, you know, like I heard UFC 300, you know, it's like, yeah, like there's issues there. Um, this is out of, let me see where this is. Uh, where is this at before I give you the, they're not telling me where it was. Oh, I just read you the headline. UFC fighter rushed to hospital with testicular injury. So UFC fighter uh, Kun Lung Arglang, he looks like he's Filipino, was rushed to the hospital after receiving a devastating blow from Daniel Marcos, another Filipino, during a clash at the Las, in Las Vegas on Saturday. Well, shit, this wasn't it. Where was this at? The, chi- oh, the Chinese fighter who was fighting on the undercard of Jack uh, Hermanson versus Joe Fire was taken to the emergency room immediately after the bout. Uh, under... Arglucling, I can't even say his name, underwent a testicular ultrasound and precautionary CT scan of his head and face right after the fight, which was deemed a no contest. So basically, you look at this video. Let me send you this one. There's a, there's a, they have a screenshot of this, of the, of the fighter kicking the other fighter right in the nuts in the air. <laughs> it looks, I mean, it looks, it's, so Marcos caught Arguino in the groin with a kick, and the referee, like the guy is in the the guy that took the shot oh. is in the air. He's he's in the air. Oh. Like both his feet are probably. I don't know if he was like coming to do some flying kick, and you know the 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 woke hair, red haired, whatever mohawk guy, go ahead and gives a front heel kick, like just like the bottom of the heel, right into the nads. And it's all the body weight. It's just like, oh, man. Uh, the the ball-kicked guy tried to carry on after being caught in the grip of Marcos. But after after being taken – after taking the full five count, he was unable to continue. So – but, you know, you get kicked in the balls. It's considered a no contest. So – Now, in the original UFC, back – when it was very first starting out when even back when the Senate was trying to make it illegal, uh, groin shots were actually legal. I remember when you was, you have, I remember, so I, I actually have a third degree black belt and I remember it was, was it 90, 90, 92 or 94, maybe. I remember they had this one fight. I don't think they called it. Did they? I can't remember. Maybe they called it a UFC, but they. But it was only supposed to be a one-time thing where they were going to have all these different styles of you know martial arts were going to fight, and they're like, who's going to be the ultimate fighter? And it was yeah. that's where the first time we all saw this these Gracie people because there was like a. Uh-huh. Like a Taekwondo guy, and there was a Kung Fu guy, and I think there was, I think there was even a Tai Chi guy. Like that was, it was terrible. Like the Tai was, Chi guy just got mauled. Yeah, and, it was like a single elimination tournament. Yeah, and um, like I remember watching all that, you know, because I mean, I, you know, I actually went on to be an instructor, but um, like I remember, I think. I think groin shots were probably okay. Was I? I think eye gouging has never been okay, right? I get the only two rules were no eye gouging and no fish hooking in the first half dozen or so UFCs. So actually, UFC three, the champion of that tournament is a guy I know up in Omaha. He's a, I think he's retired now, but he was an OPD officer. Uh, the guy that was supposed to fight Hoist Gracie in the finals got hurt, so this guy named Steve Jenham stepped in and that beat Hoist familiar. Gracie. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, like, I mean, this is, like, yeah, but, but, you know, but this is all what started 
basically mixed martial arts. Mix people don't think about it today, but mixed martial arts today is the American martial art. Like if you think of, you know, Eskrima or stick fighting for the Philippines or, you know, uh, uh, Okinawan karate, possibly for Japan or judo for Japan, or, you know, you can do, uh, the, the, uh, Shaolin, uh, monk, uh, Kung Fu Kempo stuff like from China or the, you know, the Sambo was like Russian and, Mm -hmm. you know, UFC, like uh, mixed martial arts where it's basically to try to be a well-rounded puncher, kicker and grappler is the American martial art as a result of all these UFC fights. Yeah. Because you have to be well-rounded in everything. Uh, You look at the earliest UFC fights and they look really amateurish compared to what we have nowadays with the highest level fighters. Yeah. Because one person may come in and, and he may have been a shoot fighter. This guy, Gracie was a jujitsu guy. The whole family was, uh, Dan Severn was a wrestler and they figured out, you know, after a while guys would learn how to defend against the wrestling or guys would learn how to defend against the jujitsu. And then guys would have to learn how to incorporate the wrestling to get to the ground fighting jujitsu. So it's, it's really evolved into, like you said, the American martial arts now, because you have to be well-rounded in everything from striking to, you know, Aikido, jujitsu, wrestling, a little bit of everything, you know, Mm -hmm. like I used to subscribe to a black belt magazine and, um, you know, I've been out of it for a while. Um, once I became a professional dirtbag, but um, <laughs> but um, I wonder. Like I, you know, I don't, I don't really. I mean, you know, there's like there's a there's a couple, there's one or two, like organizations here. I think in Cincinnati where people will come here because they want to train in, to be MMA fighters. For some reason, like there's must be a guy here or something. And um, I'd occasionally see these guys at the gyms I'd work out at and, you know, to get to talking to them. And but I wonder if with the exception of maybe the MMA gyms and possibly the jujitsu gyms, because, you know, a lot of them are basically like a Gracie offshoot now or like there's another school, but it's basically like a Gracie style, Brazilian style jujitsu. Um if all these, like, I wonder if other martial arts have kind of died, like, I wonder if their enrollment has gone down, like, you know, cause like in the, cause we went through these, we went through, if you remember, like we went through these periods in culture, you know, a lot of it was driven by the, um, by Hollywood, but you know, you would see like, how was it? So I guess was sixties. I guess I would say Bruce Lee was kind of a Kung Fu guy, really. So Kung Fu was big in the 70s, right? In the 60s and the 70s. And then it turned into karate. Taekwondo was really big around here in the 80s. Then Taekwondo, I remember Taekwondo got, yeah, it was big, it got real big. And then, like, there was even a movie. Where it was basically, uh, it was, um, and it wasn't real tight. It wasn't straight Taekwondo because I don't think Taekwondo guys can punch the face, if I recall. Like there's some of these restrictions on Taekwondo, but it was like, was the movie the best of the best? Like that was, mm-hmm. and like, then that was a thing for a while. And then there was, um, oh, wait a minute. It was, oh, and then we went through, and then we went through, Steven Seagal showed up. And then it was all this Aikido stuff started. And people were doing Aikido. And then after Steven Seagal, I think it was Jeff Speakman. And Jeff Speakman showed up and he was a Kenpo guy. For uh, He was under Ed Parker. And Ed Parker was basically a California, a California, Hawaii martial arts guy um, under probably from like William K.S. Chow. Like I really used to know all this shit, and um, <laughs> like 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 um like um, Ed Parker, like he was Elvis's karate teacher. Uh-huh. So um, but like then 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 after Speakman, it turned into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. 
kind of, you know, came onto the scene and then MMA became its own thing. And it's like, ever since then, I don't really, I don't really see like dudes either fight MMA or do do jujitsu. Like you don't see like, like, I can't remember the last time I met a cop that had a black belt in Taekwondo. Yeah. See, now when I first hit the streets, that was kind of a big thing. If that if was you were a big into thing. martial arts, it was Taekwondo. Mm-hmm. It was Taekwondo. Uh, yeah, it absolutely was. One of there our, was a time. Yep. We had an instructor at the uh, Iowa Law Enforcement Academy named Gil Hansen. He was, uh, I believe it was Mr. America in 1976. But mm-hmm. he was, he had a super high level black belt in Taekwondo. Two different occasions, he had to actually go to, go to Korea to test for it. He couldn't even do it in America. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He was Mr. America Mr. America bodybuilder or Mr. America as a Taekwondo guy? No, he was Mr. America as a bodybuilder and Taekwondo Holy shit. was Yeah. He's you look back, you look up badass motherfucker in the dictionary, this guy's picture is there. Yeah. He's um, some some guy he was in his sixties when he was in his sixties. I'm not even sure if he's still alive, but he was in his sixties and you know was still repping in the fours on the bench just just to show us that it could be done at like sixty three. You know, but just like a guy with like massive like tree trunk legs like kicking over somebody's head is like dang. Um you know, I mean Yeah. And that's he, pretty impressive. Had, yeah, and I mean, and his flexibility for as huge as he was was just incredible. I mean, I'm a pretty big old boy, and he could monkey flip me <laughs> like I was nothing. <laughs> Better than the alternative monkey something I, else. <laughs> I, was, I was in the air going, son of a bitch, am I ever going to land? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if he wasn't your friend, he might have monkey fucked you. So, well, you know, since you're, since we're talking about law enforcement and you're an old, uh, old, old hand in law enforcement, I want to ask you a question. When you were in, when you were in law enforcement, were you ever asked to join your, your department's dance team? <laughs> uh, no. Matter of fact, at a policeman's ball, we got drunk enough to dance one time and we were told not to do that. <laughs> so well, apparently in New York, you know, you've got you got cops getting beat up by migrants and then like they let them out, you know, without even like bail, but they're spending money. NYPD dance and New York Police Department is facing opposition over its extracurricular dance crew with critics demanding officers focus more on combating crime and less on their dance moves. Uh founded in twenty twenty two the team was intended to serve as a place for officers to unwind after their shifts. The dancers practiced two or three times a week, performing at city schools, galas, and and other events. Let me sh- bring you some pictures. Let me I've sing. seen them. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> it, it is super. Did you notice that the dancers on either end never did any of the floor moves? Because I don't think they could get back up. Now, there's some heifers here. Okay, there's there's a couple <laughs> that are like, you know. It's like, you know, there's some, there's some, there's there's some market ready beef there, (laughs) you know? And it's like, the thing is, it's like, okay, well, like maybe it's like a little dance team and you know, they're all cops and it's just, that's how they met. Like, no, no, no. They're wearing NYPD jerseys and coordinated outfits. And it's like, this is, this is not like a, this is, this has been approved and signed off on, on so many levels that the average person doesn't understand. And it's yeah. like, and you know, and I hate to say this, but they might as well call it, call it what it is. Every one of these people that's they're it's girls. And, you know, it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something real shitty. I'm going to say something really shitty and I don't mean it to be shitty. And so I'm going to structure it in a way that's to be, if you, choose to take this shitty listener that's on you but if you try to not so if you look at there so i'm looking at the pictures one two three four five six there's seven girls so that this is seven this is seven salaried police officers 
okay, whatever that whatever that payroll is plus benefits and insurance, you know, and workman's comp and you know all the you know the the payroll taxes. That's seven police officers, every single one of them, the exception of maybe the black girl because she doesn't like she's heavy in the middle and they're making her the star. All these other girls would never, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't win a basic fist fight. And I, especially as I get older and more experienced and, you know, being around, I don't like the idea of hiring police officers that can't fight. I'm not saying every police officer needs to be Mr. USA. A police officer can, you know, can be, you know, four foot seven fire plug for all I care. But this is a lot of money. There's a lot of money tied up in just what I'm looking at here. And I don't see a lot of law enforcement return for the taxpayer dollar here. And I know what I'm saying. And I look and I realize I, I, I know the argument. And here's what someone's going to say. They're going to say, and they're not completely wrong, but, you know, a little bit of good, it's like a dessert, like a little bit of, of, you know, uh, of a dessert is fine on top of your meal. But if you just eat the dessert all the time, it's going to rot your teeth in your brain. Okay. The idea that like, well, you know, if we have female officers, we have these female officers because... You know, sometimes when you're when you're when you're up against somebody and you get into this mano a mano ego thing, sometimes the female officer can play the different role and kind of sidestep some of that ego bullshit. And look, I get it. And there's you know the like the whole idea of like the female engagement team, or you know, I I get some of that. But you got you got a city that's in crisis. You got a crime you've got crime that's out of control it's it's not i mean it, it it it's so out of control in new york and all these cities part of the reason why i'm get i you know getting out of you know hamilton county because it's still it's a big city is that the 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 future for these places is not going to be good over the next five to ten years possibly longer if, if history is any guide you know, the cities in, in, in America got very dangerous starting in the late 60s all the way into the – the, about the late 80s. Very dangerous. That's where all these cops made all their bones. And these famous police gunfighters, you know, a lot of them, that's where they, you know, they made their bones and their careers fighting all this super violent crime. That's where the Wonder Nine comes from. When, you know, the militarization of the police department that people complain about. And it's like – I'm looking at these women and I respect them for, for wearing the badge and, you know, and, and, and taking the oath and, and, and doing everything that they do. But I want these girls in the jujitsu class, not in this, because this is terrible. And I don't, I don't, you know, and if everything I've said is wrong, if everything I've said is going to get me canceled or, you know, you're going to stop listening to me. I don't mean this from a sense of sexism or any kind of ism that you can think. I'm just going to postulate this. I'm going to post pictures of these women on the website and I'm going to ask you this question. You're about to get into it with a 200 pound badass motherfucker on the street and you got to call 911 who do you want showing up a cop who can fight or one of the picture of one of these girls and when you look at the picture on these girls on the website in the comment section I want you to ask yourself that question and you know in your heart of hearts what the answer is you do and this is this is not good this is this is terrible what this is you know the first time like? i saw the video if you'd have taken all the nypd identifiers off of them i would have said something like that is a feminist interpretive dance test they need a c minus on this dance oh they can't even dance the semester and they are not trying to get a c they're setting the bar at c minus 
and we're not going to try and get to a C or even a C plus. It is that bad. Yeah, and it's like, okay, it's like, you, you know what? You make a good point because I hadn't even focused on that. It's, it'd be one thing if it's like, okay, let's say all of these women are, every one of them is the most badass, you know, they work at one police plaza, the IT department, you know, they work in, you know, uh, uh, criminal, you know, data mining for, for analyzing crime, crime patterns. Okay. That's, that's all, you know, let's say like, let's say they're all indispensable in other ways, which is fantastic. Love it. Why are you putting these women that can't dance with NYPD representing the city, representing the department in front of people? Why are you doing this? These people can't, it's not even, it's so bad. It's, you know, it, it's one of these things where it's like, if you want to engage in this kind of activity, do it on your own time. If you want to work at a company that does stuff like this, that's fantastic. Go work at Google. This is not the place. You know, law enforcement is a serious business. Law, look, I'm all for gallows humor. I'm all for you know, uh, not taking yourself too seriously, but this is crazy. I mean, this is, this is so, so crazy when you like, you know, this story is being shown on the media in the news up next, New York city, uh, whatever, whatever dance team now back to crime. Yeah. I'll tell you what, they're Central Park today are following up on the murders of three kids and whatever, and he saw it or whatever, and then blah, 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 blah. And like you put this next to that in the, you know, and you're just like, do you guys have a public information officer? Do you have a public affairs office? Holy shit. Actually, hell. they do. It is the gal that got fired from Bud Light. Man. Man. I mean, this is like. Oh, here you go. You scroll down in the story, the same story. Here's here's the pictures of the asylum seekers beating up these cops. Yeah. And it's like, oof. you know, like I had a joke like around like it actually came up yesterday. It was just kind of a joke, um, but kind of not. It's just a source of frustration. It's like I should run for sheriff. And, you know, like the idea, like people that know me, the idea that I can run for sheriff is so bonkers, crazy people, like people that know me, like you gotta be, you're out of, you're like, you're out of your mind. But literally, like I see stuff like this and I start to say to myself, my campaign platform would be, yeah, I understand that I'm not a traditional, you know, candidate to run for county sheriff. But looking at what's been going on the past five or ten years in our society, apparently I'm the only adult left in the room, so I'm running. Because this bullshit's got to stop. Like, just like all of this has got to stop. Like, this, you know, the, like, you know, this is the same problem. You know, we're people that like, oh, we're going to block the highway. It's like we're going to have a bunch of people block the highway and we're going to back up traffic and, and shut down the city because there's, you know, just, you know, 15 people are blocking the highway. It's like, well, you know, I I, I mean, I hate to tell you this and I, I'm sorry, this is going to, this is going to, this is going to make everybody mad. This is going to make the Democrats mad. It's going to make the Republicans mad. It's going to make the administration mad. It's going to make the command staff mad. It's going to make everybody mad. But if I was sheriff of the goddamn county, I would say get out the riot batons and clear the fucking road. This, this, like this, everything has to be this, just fucking, just lukewarm. Well, it's nothing we can do. Well, it's going to be okay. Or yeah, the little dance team. I would be okay with the police dance team if the city was like. You know, man, this city's great. Crime is great. You know, we're this is doing a great job. This is awesome. You know, thank you for your service and all that. But it's, it's, you know, large institutions, large organizations. They become unmanageable and they become, 
they become self-defeating. And whether it's a military unit or whether it's a police department or whether it's a city, it becomes too big and it's just it's just lost. It's just terrible what's going on here. So anyway, I'm going to get off of it because people don't want to hear about it. <laughs> anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm just looking at these pictures just going, my God, my God. So, all right. So I guess we're not going to talk about the acorn and the cop thing because everyone else is talking about it. Have you seen yeah, that? Yeah, that, that one's been beat up pretty hard. Uh, that was just a bad deal. And there's two people right there that how they – how they became cops in the first place is beyond me. Uh, it's the lowering of standards. It's I, I don't know what it is. It's I, I can't defend it whatsoever. I haven't actually there, really watched the video. Like I guess I don't. I, I don't. Like, did it? Did a did an acorn hit the officer? Or did it hit the car? It hit the car. And, and the what, suspect was already in cuffs in the back seat. So he must have thought that the suspect pulled out a gun and was shooting from the back seat because we've had that yep. happen here. Yep. And even to the point of as he's returning fire, he yelled, "I'm hit! I'm hit!" And then the female sergeant's like, "Well, if he's shooting, I'm going to shoot too." So she starts unloading on him. So they were shooting at a guy in the car, in handcuffs, in the back of the car. Was he, was he, was he shot? Did he live? Uh, he lived. He ducked down and evidently they were bad shots to boot. Well, well, I'll tell you what we got. I got two stories around here because I I was kind of capping on the girls. So I'm going to tell two stories around here about that. I got two of them. Um, there's a story from, these are both Cincinnati police stories. The first one is. There was a, this is in reverse chronological order. There was a police officer, there was on the west side, District 3, um, daylight near the corner of probably Harrison and Westwood Northern Boulevard, for anyone that's familiar with the, uh, you know, greater Cincinnati area. And it was, you know, got, you know, whatever it is, got somebody, got him hooked up. And so they tell this, you know, they tell this young officer, female, they're like, um, you know, hey, take him downtown and book him in because they're they're too busy to book him in. So, you know, they – and she's a, a relative – I think she's a rookie, but, you know, transfer him downtown while they're still processing the scene. He's in handcuffs in the back of a cruiser. And she makes it – a out a mile down the road at a busy intersection in the middle of like about 4.30, coming up on 5 o'clock. And from the back seat, it's pow. And she ducks out of the car and she bails and she starts dumping rounds into this guy in the back seat because he pulled a gun out of his asshole and tried to try to shoot her in the back of the head because he was fishing around. She's like, what are you doing back there? And he ended up producing a gun and took a shot at her while she was driving and, you know, <clears throat> killed him. And, you know, it was a big investigation. It's about, you know, we all know where this is going to go. Like, did you check him? Well, did you check him? Because more than one person is supposed to check him. And then it's like, well, they're putting him, him in her car. Did she check him? But the reality is, you know, these other people probably should have checked him first. They're all ultimately responsible. But she, you know she was downstream from this mistake and she fought and she won. That's the kind of female cop I want. I want a female cop yep. that's going to stay in the fight and going to kill a motherfucker. Cause that's, who's going to show up to save me when I call nine one one. Second story is a few years earlier. I'm trying to remember this officer's name. What is her name? I can see her face. She's relatively young been on the force less than five years, possibly three. She's working a solo unit. She's working third shift in the city because, you know, young officer, she's going to, she's not going to get the choice shift. She's going to, she's going to get the, she was either working third or what they would call power, which is like a nine, eight, nine PM to 5 AM on, you yep. know, on like, you know, the power shifts. So she's driving on, 
Central Avenues. This is a major thoroughfare in downtown Cincinnati. It's it's a dev- it's in the city. It's not a highway, but it's a boulevard, kind of almost like a like a like a boulevard, like you would see almost as wide as some of the streets you see in Washington D.C. And um, like it's four, four lanes on one side, four lanes on the other. As a matter of fact, District Police Headquarters was down near this. Um, there's music hall down there. The the current um, if you're a, a fan of soccer. The current soccer stadium is built right and on this road, and she's down there, and it's two or three o'clock in the morning, whatever it is, and she's driving down this road, and there's a there's an individual pedestrian. He's crossing the road, and he um, he waves her down, and she stops. I think he might have had a radio or a boombox or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. She stops. She's like, "Yeah, what do you need?" And he pulls out a gun. He literally shoots her point blank. Shoots her point blank, and you know dumps rounds into her, multiple rounds, pushes her because the killer pushes her over into the passenger seat, and she you know like pushes her on the floor, rolls her body over, and then he gets in a car and he starts driving, and can't so he made it he. And if he turned the car around, he went down Central, turned, went north on Liberty. So he's he, he's leaving this big boulevard area, and he's heading towards the one of the tough ghetto areas, which is the next neighborhood over. And she regains her composure, pulls out her Smith & Wesson 59 series handgun, reaches up, and blows his ass away while he's driving. Puts rounds in him. And, I mean, she puts multiple rounds in him. And the car crashes into a building. And then she's got a radio on her person. And, you know, she's trying to, she's literally upside down in the car. And, you know, you know, officer, you know, I've been shot, the radio call. And so, you know, and it was a, it's a big scandal and whatever. And, you know, she ended up being medically retired. She got the uh, award for valor. But there's an interview with her and I'm going to try to find it. And the interview is, she's, you know, talking about the scenario and whatever and all these things. At the end of the interview, she says, somebody was going to die that night and it wasn't going to be me. I want cops who can fight. And if they can't fight or they don't have the mindset to fight or they don't have the ability, get them off the street, get them off of get them out of roles where they're going to have to defend themselves put up you know the property room needs manned you know uh bookkeeping needs manned uh property needs manned hey where are you going to send all your disciplinarian cases if you have if you if you you know you know what i'm talking about you, yeah. you know exactly what i'm talking about so all right. Well, let's go ahead and do the police blotter, and we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. So, oh, hey, one one thing, real quick. The uh, we were talking about this, and it kind of segues into this. Uh, the shootings in Kansas City at the Chiefs parade. Did wait? Did you see Ann Coulter talk about that? I didn't see Ann Coulter talk about it, but they've made a they've made a couple more arrests. Yeah. The the part that they're that they're not talking about. And I have an acquaintance that used to be Kansas City PD. Now he's on a different department, a little more local to me. So he still has connections down there. The part they're not talking about is it's gang related, but it wasn't a prior gang beef. It was two groups of individuals from rival gangs that basically one was talking smack to the other and off they went. Uh, for whatever reason, they're not putting that out there. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, politically motivated to spin it that way, but I've got it on pretty good authority that it, it was gang related. Yeah, it looked like it's just minors that are just, you know, they were beefing and they started shooting each other. Like one kid, yeah. I think I heard like they're not showing them. He got his jaw blown off, right? Mm-hmm. So, but he did he actually 
the the kid that got his jaw blown off was he 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 was she also shot a gun right i believe so yeah there were there were multiple shooters and as i understand it there's one or two adults now that are under also well what's interesting is because I, th- I thought about this and it, you know a lot of people aren't going to want to make the aren't going to want to hear this but if let's say the kid who got his jaw blown off if he didn't fire first depending on a situation if i if i was his lawyer i would be looking for an angle to claim self defense yeah which may actually be legit mm-hmm. You know, even if you're engaged in, you know, I mean, there's, there's, it's not exactly that. You know, even if you're engaged in criminal, if you're a criminal, you still have a right to self-defense. I mean, it, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't get to pull the gun on someone, then claim self-defense when you shoot them. But, yeah. you know, and they, you know, but it's like, it's, it could be interesting. Like this, this case could get more interesting than what people, what people are thinking. So, yeah. So what um, PD is putting out is it all started over one guy mean mugging another. And it sounds like there was a very brief verbal altercation, and then it went to guns right away. Yeah, I don't, you know, like, so there's a, there's a video, Ann Coulter, she's on, she's on the, um, she was on a a Bill Maher show, and she's there up there with Van Jones, and like, this is video circulating the past two days. And they're talking about, you know, whatever. And they're, they're they're basically saying nonsense. Like, why does this keep happening? And I'm um, like, we don't know. Who, and like, they say something like, we don't know who, we don't know who this is. And Ann Coulter goes, yeah, we have an idea. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, we don't. And, and, and what's interesting is, so Bill Maher goes, no, we don't. They haven't told us. She goes, yeah, we have an idea. And um, he's like, what do you mean? She goes, well. Well, they haven't, they haven't told us who it was, and they're not telling us. And if that, that typically means it's probably not a white person. And he's like, you, you don't, you know, they're all there. He's incredulous. Like, you don't, you can't know. She's like, yeah, we know this. And she starts giving all these examples. She talks about the shooter, the, the trans person that shot up the Catholic school or the Christian school. She talks about the, um, they didn't talk about that for a year. She talked, they're still not talking about it. Uh, she talks about San Bernardino, the two Muslims, how she's like, yeah, it's funny. Like, you know, they're not telling us like the shooting has happened and like it's going, they're not telling us. She's like, that's weird. Like, why aren't they telling us? And it's like, oh, because it's not a white person. And what's interesting is to watch her. And he's like, well, we don't know because they haven't told us. And, but Anne has superpowers. But what's really interesting is Van Jones is sitting right next to Ann Coulter for this entire conversation. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't shake his head. He doesn't because he knows to. Yep. And it's like, oh, God, if we can't start telling the truth about stuff. You can't fix a problem until you can be honest about the problem and all aspects of it. Yeah. So here's let's go to the police blotter. So yeah. I've got three for you, and uh, two two good ones, and then one really, 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 really. Let's see here. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, so the first one is, and this is just goes into my like again. You know, like I why I want to run for sheriff. I'm not. I mean, I can, but you know. <laughs> um, but like you know, it's like protesters were arrested in Washington for throwing pink powder on the Constitution. Again, it's probably under bulletproof glass, but you've seen a number of these. Like it's it's for the environment or whatever. They're you know save save the the Delta smelt or whatever their thing is, yeah. you know. And it's like there's like guards standing there and they're not doing anything. And it, you know like people that are throwing soup on the Mona Lisa. Like I would fucking I would I would be in there with night. I I forget the PR twenty four. I get the old the old the old police batons from like the forties that all the old coppers really like, I'd be beating the fuck out of these people. And, you know, and it's like, yeah, so, you know, that, that apparently, you know, we can't do anything about that. The second one is, um, there's a guy in Arizona and he was arrested for stealing a truck. 
And do you know what this truck had on it? Mm -mm. Like, if you're going to steal a truck, uh, you know, I, 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 okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a hint. You stole a truck, and it had cars. It was a car carrier. So if you're going to steal a car carrier, what car, if you're a red-blooded American, what car would be on this car carrier? What would this uh, car carrier be? Probably a vet. It was an entire truckload of Corv of C A Corvettes, oh, over one million dollars worth of Corvettes. Well, apparently, well, apparently, and I don't know, it would be one million dollars, probably including the price of the truck, of the of the of yeah. the tractor and the trailer, because Corvettes aren't that expensive. They're not. They're not two hundred thousand dollars. So, um, but maybe it could be a million dollars. I mean, it's, how many how many cor how many cars can fit on a car carrier? Well, six or eight anyway, depending. Eight. No, okay, you could okay if you're like 120, 130, 140, you could get up close to a million dollars. So the final story is out of Texas. Tell me if you've heard this one. Kilt wearing pervert arrested for shoving antiques up his up his rectum. <laughs> no, I, I have not heard that one. This one is this one is amazing. This one is amazing. So Texas antique dealer struggled. To struggled to believe their eyes when surveillance footage revealed a shopper in a kilt furtively, furtively inserting display items up his bottom before returning them to the shelves. So he's some kind of weird fetish. Word spread quickly through the business community in spring after the heavily built man was first spotted at the Antique Gallery of Houston on February the 8th. I had to watch it a couple times to be sure I knew what I was looking at, gallery manager Susan Golden told uh, Fox 26. Wait a minute, Susan Golden. There's a Golden Antiques uh, that Mr. Golden down there in Charleston. He was big, you know. Anyway, um, I've seen quite a few things here, but not that. And let's see, it continues. Hold on. Michael C. Vast, 60, was arrested February 15th and charged with one count of criminal mischief for his treatment of items, including a makeup brush, a restoration hardware piece, an antique bottle opener, and a tobacco tent can. Police are still looking for a female companion who appeared to accompany him. Uh, Vest allegedly was seen loitering for hours in antique stores across the area and sticking items up his bottom before returning them to the shelf. He was arrested on February 15th and charged one count of grudges repeating because it's written by AI. I uh, had to watch it a couple times. I knew what I was looking at. So this guy shoved both items up his anus and then returned them to the shelf. He appeared to, he, this, this is apparently a fetish that this guy's up into. He apparently was in maybe, maybe like all these antique stores are on a lookout for this guy. The male was then observed removing items and placing them back on shelves. Constable Mark Herman of the Harris County Police Department reported during first further investigation, Constable investigators were able to positively identify the male as Michael Vet as Michael Vest, uh, and he is wearing. Let me send you this. Let me send you this. He is wearing a. Well, hell, this isn't going to work. I have to send it to you later. He's wearing a. He's wearing a kilt, but it's a. Um, is that a camo kilt? Is it like? I don't know how kilts work. So. But apparently this is now a thing. So if you're going to the if you're going to the antique store and um, you know, you pick something up, you may want to smell it to make sure it, you know, some crazy person hasn't shoved it up his asshole. Because <laughs> you know, like I mean, like, you know, like this is the kind of guy that, you know, should normally would be in, in jail or an institution, but you know, say la vie, right? All right. Well, this wraps up episode 332 of the John 1911 podcast. If you want to see a number of stories or pictures or links of anything we discussed, please go to the website at john1911.com. That's J O H at 1911.com. Remember, it's all about shooting guns and having fun. Everybody, have a good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>